Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, welcome to this forum on reform in Uzbekistan, a turning point for Central Asia and beyond, which is hosted by the Central Asia Caucasus Institute. I am Svante Cornell. I'm the director of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute. Um, this event has a twin purpose. Um, the first uh, is to hear directly from uh, key implementers of reform and maybe strategists of reform in Uzbekistan uh, and hear from them about the process taking place in the country. Uh, the second purpose of this event is to mark the launch of the most recent book of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, Uzbekistan's New Face, uh, edited by the chairman of the Institute, Professor Starr and myself. Uh, this book, um, which brings together uh, leading specialists on various subjects, uh, is the first comprehensive analysis of the process of change that has been taking place in Uzbekistan almost exactly for two years now. Um, we have at least one uh, contributor, Anthony Boyer, is somewhere right at the back. He's hiding from, uh, from us, um, who has spent 25 years at IFES. We have other uh, contributors, including people like Musha Sever, the head of a uh, NGO, Regional Dialogue, that's been active in Uzbekistan for, for over 15 years, among other. Uh, we encourage you to uh, get a copy of the book. They're available at the entrance for $20, which is much lower than the list price of $38, so I encourage you to take this opportunity today. It's not going to come back. Get them for your mother, too. Yes, the, and for your mother-in-law. <laughs> um, now, uh, before introducing the speakers, I'll just like to say a few uh, words of introduction on the, on the topic. Uh, why uh, does what's happening in Uzbekistan matter to the United States? Why should we be interested? Now, it's, a for, it's of course a good thing that a country in Central Asia has embarked on a, on a, on a comprehensive political, economic, and judicial reform. Uh, but beyond that, uh, we uh, at the Central Asia Caucasus Institute view this uh, in a much broader light as a seminal event in the modern history of Central Asia. Now, Uzbekistan is historically the center of Central Asia. Uh, it has a population comparable to all the rest of post-Soviet Central Asia put together. It borders every state in Central Asia, including Afghanistan. There are Uzbeks living in all uh, other regional states, again, including Afghanistan. So what happens in Uzbekistan, so to speak, does not stay in Uzbekistan. It has an impact on the broader region. Uh, and as I write in my own contribution to the an introduction to the book, uh, Uzbekistan has played a, a crucial role in enabling the emergence of a Central Asian region that is independent of great powers and that rejects extremist ideologies. And now there are two large states in Central Asia, of course, uh, one le uh, even leaving aside Afghanistan, which by population is the largest. Uh, but un unlike the other significant regional power, which is Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan has one, a geographical advantage that it doesn't border Russia. And in the, in the past 25 years at the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, we have written quite prolifically about how Kazakhstan has worked hard and successfully to consolidate its independence in a very difficult both geographic and demographic context. Uh, but Uzbekistan has had, for all of this period, both the willingness uh, and the ability to support policies that very much emphasize independence and sovereignty. Uh, while seeking a positive cordial relationship with Russia on the basis of mutual respect for sovereignty and independence, Uzbekistan has perhaps across the region been the most adamant about emphasizing that sovereignty and that independence. Um, and it follows the same approach with all regional, with all great powers, whether that be China or the United States. And in the same way, we saw, especially from the early 1990s, uh, when there were serious threats to the entire region in terms of uh, radical extremist ideologies, that Uzbekistan took a very firm stand against extremism and in favor of secular governance, which is the uh, model adopted by every country in Central Asia. So the current changes in Uzbekistan and the country's embrace of a greater sense of regionalism and cooperation across the region has quite profound implications for what Central Asia will look like going forward and also what kind of partner it will be for the United States and for, for the West. Now let me briefly introduce our speakers, since you came to hear them and not me. 
Uh, first, we will hear from uh, Professor Frederick Starr, who's the founding chairman of the Central Asia Caucasus Institute, among others, uh, former president of Oberlin College and a provost at Tulane, advisor to several presidents, but perhaps most importantly, author of Lost Enlightenment, a quite heavy book, uh, I must say, that, uh, that describes how a thousand years ago Central Asia was the intellectual center of the world. Um, we will then hear from His Excellency Minister Sherzad Shermatov, who is the Minister of Public Education of Uzbekistan. He is a graduate of uh, Tashkent State Technical University and has a master's degree from Yale, which means that together with Professor Starr, we have two Yale uh, alumni on the panel, which is perhaps a little bit of a distortion uh, of the balance. Uh, Minister Shermatov served previously as uh, Vice Chairman of the State Committee for Communications and IT. He was a rector of Inha University in Tashkent. Uh, he has also been a first deputy minister for IT and communications. And since June of this year, he is the minister uh, of public education uh, for Uzbekistan, which means, Mr. Minister, you have a tremendous responsibility because the entire next generation of Uzbeks depends on, on you and your work. So we wish you all the best of luck. Finally, we have uh, in, uh, in the, uh, on the panel Eldor Aripov, who is uh, for a long time a close friend of our institute who has a uh, background in diplomacy and in think tanks. He is presently the director of the Center for International Relations Studies in Tashkent. He has a PhD in political science from the University of World Economy and Diplomacy, also in Tashkent. Uh, he served here, as many in this room will know, more than a decade ago, maybe 15 years ago now, uh, at the embassy. He also uh, then had a, had a career that included positions as deputy foreign minister, and as first Deputy State Advisor to the President and Deputy Secretary of the National Security Council. And before the position at this think tank, he's also been the Director of the Center for Strategic and Regional Studies in Tashkent. Last but not least, we have, uh, we have uh, a wealth of knowledge in, among our audience, that we and we encourage you to participate. And I would like to extend a special welcome to our Rumsfeld Fellows. Please uh, raise your hands. Uh, we have 12 fellows that just came to Washington. This is their first week. Uh, they will be here for six weeks as part of our program that's now been going on for 10 years and which has, David, how many alumni? More than, over 200. More than 200 alumni. And in, uh, in uh, our yearly conference, the Kamka Forum will be held in Tashkent in June of this year. I encourage everybody to visit and to take part of it. Um, Dr. Starr, the floor is yours. You, you may choose to speak from here or from here. Thank you. That Comca Forum in June, put it in your books. It is the most it is the regional forum that treats the region as a region. And, and this is where bright younger people and not younger people assemble. Our former fellows include many who are now heads of major businesses, who are running newspapers television systems in Afghanistan, et cetera, et cetera. They're all now coming into top positions. This is the place to meet and to make contact with the new Central Asia and the Caucasus and, of course, Afghanistan. Now, um, this book, the attempt here was to put in one place a comprehensive overview of the many reforms that are taking place simultaneously in Uzbekistan. These, re the, these cross, uh, we don't cover them all. We don't cover education, for example. <coughs> but it, it is an amazing and comprehensive set of, set of reforms instituted uh, seemingly in a very, very short period of time. Um, we wanted, that so many of these were issued overnight and very suddenly uh, that we wanted to pull them all together so one could get a sense of what's really going on. And why is this important? Because some of them were decrees, some of them were orders, some of them were acts of parliament. They had all sorts of different legal status. And we couldn't do this alone. I mean, the, 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 this, these uh, data were just not available. So we turned to our old friends in Tashkent, especially 
uh, Eldor Aripov, who is here, who, who provided us with texts of some of these decrees and if it, we could not otherwise have, uh, have, have obtained. I'm not sure you had them all before we asked. <laughs> Uh, but 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 we really want to thank the cooper great cooperation we've received from people in Tashkent and the government on this, especially getting these hard to find texts. Now we cover a, a lot of things: foreign relations by Richard White, a very uh, well known and 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 seasoned analyst here in in town. The legal side, which is a remarkable story, is covered by Musa Sever, who is a Slovenian and has been in, in, in Tashkent most of the time between 2005 and the present. And she was working with all the legal reformers from the day she arrived. And uh, if you think all this started overnight, you're wrong. She was bringing members of the Uzbek Supreme Court here several years ago. And I, I remember meeting with them as a group. They were not here on just a couple of days, uh, sort of uh, what the Russians used to call a partisan raid. Uh, they were here for, for months and, and really studying aspects of the American legal system. Very impressive. The political system, Anthony Boyer, who's sitting in the back, who is a very seasoned analyst of, of, of voluntary associations, free questions of all sorts of political participation, political parties, uh, parliaments, you name it. Uh, Anthony wrote on, on that, and, and most interestingly, the Mamuka Ceratelli, who's here, uh, wrote on the economy and brought really a lot of very fresh perspectives on it. And then uh, uh, John Daly, our old colleague uh, wrote on the international reception, which is initially a rather depressing story, and then as, as it gets toward the end, it brightens up as people came to realize that something really is going on there. Now, uh, the, the question is, what about the future? These are statements of intent. These are not accomplished facts. These are, these are legislative and other forms of decrees which it, indicate the direction of official policy in the Republic of Uzbekistan. We are in the future now in that they are beginning to implement these and very intensely. Um, and and um, what, what's uh, curious about it is that, is that it is actually uh, uh, moving simultaneously in all these directions. Very few governments do this. They identify one or two things, really go for that, then they come for one or two more. Not this government. The, President Mirzioyev has identified, I would say, 50 or 60 things, and he's put out statements on all of them and official decrees, and it's all being pursued simultaneously. It's amazing. There are already some things one can say are real that they are, they are going to be part of the future. Um, in, and uh, I just note a couple of them. One is Afghanistan. Uh, we, David Sedney, who's now a rec rector of the American University in Afghanistan, has followed these matters most, most closely. And I think anyone interested in Afghanistan or in Central Asia has to stand back and be impressed by the new attitude that Afghanistan is not a neighbor of Central Asia, it is part of Central Asia, we must, be, we must help in the solution of their problems, and their economy can also benefit us through trade and tra investment. So that's moving forward and in very concrete ways. Second, the, the, the economic reforms, the convertibility and so on and so forth, opening up of foreign investments both by and to and from Uzbekistan, uh, th this, is, this is a fact. These aren't speculations for some future time. It's already happening. The legal reforms that Musa Sever follows so closely, a lot of these are actually being implemented today. Uh, and, and how they work in actual practice, of course, will take years to, to, to figure out, but it's happening. Fourth area where something real is already happening, and I would submit was happening years before the formal announcement, and, and, and the, what changed is they put names on it, and that is in the area of religion. 
where, where the government has embraced the con uh, two important concepts. One of a, of a um, moderate Hanafi Islam that is uh, traditional to the country and, and which is relatively far more open to, to intellectual activity, to science, mathematics, logic, and all that. Than, than several of the other major schools. So that's there, and the government has embraced it and said, this is us, and we're, and, and, and we're prepared to uh, say that very publicly uh, to our neighbors as well and to Muslims elsewhere. It's a very important development. The second aspect is that the, the, they are increasingly, not just in fact, which has long been the case since the government was established in 91, increasingly they are embracing the concept of a secular state ruling a, a society that is with many, many devout believers. And the point being that only by having secular courts, secular laws, a secular state, can you really assure religious freedom? And, and the Uzbeks are coming to embrace this very consciously, and we think, I personally think emphatically, that this provides a model of great relevance to the entire Muslim world today and that the United States policy should get solidly behind it. Now, fifth area, final area, is, is the idea of the region. You know, we, we, we got so used to thinking of the stands. Well, this is absurd, yes. They do have their own languages, and they do have certain histories and identities, including ethnic identities, that are, are distinct for each of them, as there are distinctions within the countries. Nonetheless, over 2,000 years, this has been a region, a big region. And, and they have brought Afghanistan back into it, so it's grown by 35 more million people. But this is a region, and they are not talking about but practicing regional conversations in all key areas. This is growing. It's moving very fast. I think it's an extremely positive development. It's not against anyone. It is simply asserting that we have something in common, as President Nazarbayev put it. We have common interests, common understandings, common history, common culture, in spite of our different ethnic differences, linguistic differences, and we understand each other far better than outsiders understand us. This is the th notion that underlies this, this new regionalism. They are studying actively, uh, actively mo foreign models, including uh, uh, for regional coordination, including, uh, for example, uh, the Nordic Council, Mercosur, and especially ASEAN, which, as one of the uh, leaders of ASEAN today said recently, he said, the ASEAN countries, after a generation, have far less in common with each other than do the Central Asia countries today. So these are major achievements. Uh, don't, there will be problems. You know, don't read this book and say this is all, these are all accomplished facts. These are statements of intent often defined in legal and legislative terms. But uh, there are reasons not to be pessimistic about the future, that even to be optimistic that this can actually happen. One, none of this is being done out of desperation. They didn't hit bottom and now finally we're, you know, Take, adopting some sensible policies. That's not what happened. They actually, the countries survived their first quarter century intact. Their sovereignties exist. Uh, their economies, even in the case of Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan that are relatively poorer, they're talk, they're, they are exporting electricity through Casa 1000 to Pakistan and Afghanistan. These are, these are realities. So it was done not from desperation, reason for optimism. Second is, it's not as sudden, this is not happening as suddenly as we think. I think one of the interesting things to look into in the next years will be the antecedents to the reform process. There's a lot more there I mentioned. One, the, the, in the legal area, there are others. It didn't come out of the, out of the blue. The, the presidents 
uh, I'm sorry, the first party secretaries of all the Central Asian states uh, the so of the Soviet Union, back in Soviet times, regularly conferred by telephone with one another to coordinate their, respo their responses to demands coming from Moscow. They knew that divide and conquer was their enemy, and they coordinated way back then. There was a regionalism that began in Soviet times, especially under the le leadership of uh, uh, Mr. Sharipov, who was who, uh, Rashidov, what am I saying, who was the uh, uh, first secretary of the Communist Party of Uzbekistan. And f uh, a further region to be optimistic is that these reforms have, have enlisted a new generation of Uzbeks. And, uh, when, when President Karimov made his first visit here, he was asked, uh, are you going to do all these wonderful reforms? <laughs> he looked at the audience at the dinner and said no. And, and, and he, said, uh, he said, don't expect my generation to do it. We don't <laughs> understand what really what you're talking about. And he said, we're, that's why we're sending 5,000 students abroad. They come back more like you than like us, but they're ours, and they someday will make the reforms you're talking about. That day is now. Final point that I would say, and this is, this is a, 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 an important one, why one can be optimistic about this is that there is a tradition of, of, uh, of, of discipline in social discipline in, in Uzbekistan. Why? Because it is fundamentally a, an oasis society. In, a way, in an oasis, you can't just be loosey-goosey and run all over the place and be, uh, and be crazy and chaotic. You, you, you need a, 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 a hydro, hydraulic society, a, an irrigated society needs dis discipline. This was acquired by the Uzbeks over four or five hundred years. It's there today, and it means it's a moderating force in the society. So I, for one, am optimistic about the future. Maybe you will be after you read this. Maybe not under any circumstances. Stay in touch with this issue. It's fascinating. Thank you very much. Mr. Minister, the floor is yours. From here or? There? Your choice. I think we can continue from here or it's better to move there. Yeah. Uh, let me move there. Good afternoon. Uh, I, I'm really glad to be here today with you. And uh, thank you, uh, Professor Sar, for the book and for all this. Uh, introduction about and for being optimistic about the continuation of the reforms in Uzbekistan because uh, for the past two years there have been tremendous change in the in our country because I mean uh, you might be in exploring the country but we are living there so <laughs> <laughs> we feel all the change all the uh, pace of the change which was happening after the election of uh, our new president, uh, Mr. Uh, His Excellency, Mr. Shavkat Mirziyoyev. And what he started first in the economic reform. Uh, let me briefly tell, uh, try to focus on this economic part of the changes. Uh, he tried to choose the citizen-centric approach because as when he declared his main economic policy, uh, he wanted to see the well-being of our people and each and every citizen living in Uzbekistan, and uh, not after 50 years, after 100 years, but as soon as possible. Therefore, uh, the pace he has taken from the first uh, days of being elected was tremendous. Uh, we, as the members of the cabinet, uh, really experienced it, uh, working 24-7 and uh, under the, that much stress, but uh, it was really useful because you felt all this, that uh, the real problems are being solved at the place, which, for instance, uh, there were even some topics which might be taboo uh, two years ago, but they were now being very openly discussed 
at all levels. And this has all achievements. And why I'm saying it's people-centric approach, from the first days, uh, President Mirziyoyev, actually before even being elected as a president, he opened his virtual office for receiving appeals from all the citizens. So it was kind of very uh, unique uh, tool which provides uh, some overall big data about the situation in Uzbekistan so that uh, within uh, this period it has already accumulated more than two million appeals of the citizens. It was really interesting to see that, uh, for instance, in 2016, uh, within nine months of 2016, uh, people appealed to the cabinet of ministers only 16,000 times, but within two weeks of the functioning of this new system, there were 25,000 appeals. And there were the appeals of the people showing the real problems. Like, uh, I mean, it's kind of easy now to say that we have free convertibility, so we have no difference between cash and cashless payments. But two years ago, it was something which uh, every uh, citizen of Uzbekistan was facing. Uh, so that if you have an, a bank card, it was kind of difficult to get the cash. Or uh, if you have the sums, it was kind of very difficult to even imagine how to convert those sums into uh, the United States dollars. So uh, these things, after uh, president, analyzed all these areas, uh, this uh, tool uh, helped him to analyze what are the main problems in every field, including in the economic field. So despite the, all the, uh, maybe the criticism by uh, those who might oppose the uh, implementation of the liberalization of currency, he made a bold decision last year, September, that our currency should be liberalized. And there were old uh, school economies uh, which were forecasting that collapse of the economy or something like this, but one year passed successfully and Uzbekistan's economy is much better than it was two years ago. And uh, this helped us to uh, also try to eliminate uh, possible uh, discrepancies in the data. Because when you have different currency levels, it's very difficult to even analyze the economic data. And one of the goals uh, set forth by president uh, to provide objective and uh, high quality statistical data so that uh, we government can make objective decisions based on the data. So we don't have to uh, create the data just for the sake of the data. And one of the uh, main uh, uh, elements of economic reforms was opening up the foreign trade. And with the focus to uh, opening up the foreign trade with the uh, neighboring countries first. As you know, the first visits were to the neighboring countries from Turkmenistan, uh, Kazakhstan, and others. And now, within these two years, there is a complete different situation with the trade and overall cooperation between neighbors and Uzbekistan than it was two, two years ago. And this really helped to improve because, as you know, uh, the trade is the main driver of economic growth, and it really helps uh, economy to create additional jobs and to uh, move faster. Uh, and uh, when it comes to the jobs, uh, as a top priority for Uzbekistan's economic reforms was also uh, always in the focus the job creation. And the president declared that uh, from now on, all the state agencies should think of not working, uh, I mean, change the paradigm of the state agencies so that all the state agencies should uh, try to help the small and medium enterprises which are creating the jobs rather than trying to invent any bureaucracies to uh, somehow uh, make the obstacles in the opening of the business and uh, trying to uh, move the uh, small business uh, development in Uzbekistan. And therefore, uh, even special agency was created on the Ministry of Justice. It is uh, specifically designed for 
uh, business uh, process re-engineering, uh, decreasing the number of procedures, as well as trying to uh, provide the uh, services for the business people on licensing, on uh, getting access to electricity and other uh, government services. So uh, with the help of uh, creating the favorable conditions for the businesses. And uh, one of the uh, areas uh, of reforms which helped to further uh, liberalize the economy and was the decentralization of decision making. Uh, in the previous system, there was a too much centralization of the decisions, both at the level of ministries as well uh, with the center and the regional hakimiyat. So uh, president's policy was to decentralize decision making so that to give more authority to the ministries as well as uh, to give more authority as well as financial decentralization to regional hakimiyat, thus uh, stimulating regional mayors to help businesses to grow so that uh, some big portion of taxes uh, collected from the businesses residing in those regions are now being uh, left with the regional mayor's budget. Previously, all these uh, taxes were taken to the center, so this was destimulating the regional mayors and they were trying to somehow uh, put uh, any other kind of burden to the businesses try to help the, the local problems, but now all the regional mayors are trying to help the local businesses to grow so that because they know the uh, big portion of the tax revenue is now remaining in the region. So this is helping uh, up uh, the businesses in the local levels as well. And uh, also, uh, President Merzioyev, uh, he uh, tried to uh, tries to open up the new areas of business, like uh, which were previously very closed, like uh, tourism area. So for the past uh, two years, there were so many changes in the tourism, from simplification of getting visas or I implementation of e-visa system as well as uh, removal of visa requirements to several countries with the hope that so many uh, visitors can come and this could bring up extra revenue, uh, tourism revenue for Uzbekistan. So uh, even in the fields like uh, which were very conservative like agriculture are now being uh, completely reviewed uh, with the uh, aim that Agriculture is not for the sake of the agriculture, but everything which we do in the agriculture is being done through the economic perspective. So if in those lands, for instance, uh, we uh, see that the productivity of the cotton is not adequate and it's not uh, economically feasible, why should we uh, uh, harvest cotton in those areas? So president decided to shorten those cotton fields and try to give those areas to some other more profitable uh, agricultural uh, areas. And also, uh, even uh, picking up the cotton is now a completely <coughs> different system where uh, president wants to uh, match the final uh, consumer of the cotton, like the textile companies, to be the owner of the cotton fields, we call it like uh, sectors, so that now those companies are very much interested in cotton's productivity, in uh, try to uh, implement the professional uh, agricultural experts who are working hard on making those areas more profitable, so that at the end, uh, focus is to not to export raw cotton, but rather try to export uh, value-added uh, textile products. Uh, and recently, our president uh, approved the new innovative development strategy for Uzbekistan uh, with the aim that uh, by 2030, Uzbekistan should be uh, included in the uh, Global Innovation Index into the top 50 most innovative countries in, of the world. Current situation is uh, unfortunately 
not very favorable for Uzbekistan, uh, but in order to be able to be included in such high rankings, uh, we should focus more on the human capital part. And where comes the uh, educational reform, which, as you said, is not yet covered in this book, and I hope that in the next books you try to cover more on a uh, human aspect of uh, development of our country, uh, because uh, for Uzbekistan's uh, future economic prosperity, uh, the only main resource we can think of is uh, human capital, and this can really help our country to leapfrog in economic development. Uh, because, uh, as you might know, Uzbekistan is currently in economic, uh, I mean, uh, in demographic pre-dividend stage, where uh, number of children per woman is about 2.26 which is almost similar uh, when the South Korea was in 1980s. So South Korea was able to successfully uh, get most out of this demographic dividend by investing heavily into education. So now, if South Korea in 60s was among the poorest countries in the world, but by heavily investing into education and getting most out of this demographic dividend, it's now among the top 10 countries of the world. Uh, whereas in those years, Latin American countries were even providing some humanitarian assistance to this uh, South Korea, but now uh, the uh, economic development overall, GDP of those ca countries are even no, non comparable to each other. So uh, if in Uzbekistan we also try to get most out, out of this demographic dividend and now make the necessary reforms in education and invest in education, not by the state, but also by all the stakeholders involved, including the families, I hope in future we will be able to leapfrog and to be in those uh, top 50 most innovative countries of the world. With this, I would like to end today's speech and <coughs> try to give the floor to the next Speaker, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Mr. Aripov, please go ahead. Thank you, Swanto. Uh, first of all, I would like to um, express my congratulations, deep congratulations to the Professor Stein, Dr. Carnell for the with the publication of this book. I think uh, the publication of, of this book is undoubtedly a big event for Uzbekistan. It really um, literally documents the progress of reforms in Uzbekistan and it compensates the large deficit of in information, especially in the West, objective information in the West about ongoing uh, reforms in Uzbekistan. Previous speakers already uh, mentioned dynamics of internal reforms in Uzbekistan, and um, I would like to focus mostly on foreign policy of Uzbekistan, which during the last two years became un unprecedentedly open and active. And um, because of time, I just would like to focus on two big issues on uh, Uzbekistan's foreign policy. It's uh, Central Asia and Afghanistan. Um, and, you know, uh, President Mirziyaev actually declared Central Asia as a key priority of his foreign policy. And it was not just declaration. It was really well-considered, pragmatic choice. Uzbekistan, as uh, Svante already mentioned, is the only country in the region which has common border with all countries of the region and Afghanistan. And we're really connected among Central Asian countries by common interest in the field of water use, security, transport. But unfortunately, you know, uh, just recently, uh, the level of political trust among Central Asian countries was extremely low. It, it really was difficult to, uh, you know, reconcile the existing contradictions, contradictions hampered regional cooperation, and, um, you know, borders were closed, regional trade was practically frozen. But now I would say with confidence uh, that situation in Central Asia is fundamentally different uh, from what it used to be just a couple of years ago. And there are several reasons to claim them. First, uh, we were able to, um, to um, sign very important agreements, for example, on border delimitation with Tajikistan and Kyrgyzstan. Previously, the absence of these agreements really 
provoked very serious tensions. We reduced our disagreements on water use. Now uh, dozens of checkpoints are open. People could freely uh, visit their relatives in neighboring countries. Um, and we always um, repeat best example of the new situation in Central Asia. When you look at the Tashkent streets, you will see a lot of gas uh, from Kyrgyzstan, from Tajikistan, Kazakhstan, and it's absolutely new development. And this new political atmosphere really made big impulse for the development of economic relations in Central Asia. During the last six months of this year, uh, trade to know between Uzbekistan and Central Asia increased actually by 46%. Uh, we see the development of economic ties between border regions of uh, Central Asian countries. For example, again, during this first half of this year, the trade between border regions of Kazakhstan and Uzbekistan increased 50%, uh, with Turkmenistan 55%. It's absolutely new developments. Um, we we now developing new forms of industrial cooperation. Best example of it, of course, is that we started already to produce, uh, for example, Uzbek cars in Kazakhstan. We will have plans to produce uh, Uzbek buses in Kyrgyzstan, etc. And for, for the first time uh, in the history of Central Asia, in November of this year, we are going to organize a regional economic forum and to invite people from business people from all Central Asian countries and Afghanistan and give them a chance to sit and to discuss common regional projects. By the way, um, uh, during this forum, we will have first meeting of deputy prime ministers of Central Asian countries, and we believe that this will really help to, uh, to foster regional cooperation by practical decisions. So we, we were not able to solve just very specific problems. We really changed the logic of regional cooperation. We really now look at Central Asia as our common home. We really understand that we have common interests. We understand the benefits of uniting you know, our efforts in order to promote a uh, common agenda. And uh, this new thinking about Central Asia changed our perception uh, on Afghanistan too. We, we really see, the, understand that Afghanistan is a natural part of Central Asia. We are not talking about five countries already, we are talking about six countries. And uh, we understand, you know, usefulness of fencing ourselves from Afghanistan because we understand that Afghanistan is not only challenge for regional security, but also a unique strategic opportunity because uh, Afghanistan is the natural bridge which could connect uh, Central Asia with South Asia. Actually, Afghanistan could give the shortest access uh, to Central Asian countries uh, to the seaports of Persian Gulf. It will give shortest access to the energy markets of South Asia. And uh, because of this, Uzbekistan really intensified its uh, political economic contacts with Afghanistan. Um, during last year, the trade to know between Afghanistan and Uzbekistan increased by 15%. It's now $600 million. But we expect that, uh, you know, uh, in two years, we'll be able to increase this figure up to $1.5 billion. And uh, besides this, we started to implement very important infrastructural projects in, in energy sector, in transport sector, in order not only to improve economic relations in Afghanistan, but also to give powerful impulse for the regional economic cooperation between South Asia and Central Asia. And um, one of this project is uh, the construction of the railroad, which will connect um, Hairaton, uh, Mazari Sharif in the north of the country with uh, Herat in the western part of the country. Actually, it will be the prolongation of the road which already exists, uh, Mazari Sharif Hairaton, and connects Uzbekistan. Actually, according to Afghan estimates, not ours, this road will create more than 30,000 jobs in Afghanistan. The annual income from this road would be about 40 million US dollars. And actually, it will give the shortest access again to Central Asian countries, to the, uh, to the Persian Gulf, because right now, Iran is finishing construction of the railroad which connects Iranian half with uh, Herat in uh, Afghanistan. Another project, very, very interesting one, is uh, construction of the power transmission line, which will connect Surhan, it's in Uzbekistan, with Pulihumri in the north of Afghanistan. Actually, this, this project will enable Uzbekistan to increase uh, export of its electricity to Afghanistan by 70%. 
And we are already reduced the price for the supplied electricity for Afghanistan by 35%. And uh, what is important that this power, trans uh, this power transmission line connect Afghanistan to the energy circle of Central Asia. And actually, not only Uzbekistan, but also Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan could use this power transmission line in order to export their electricity, and not only to Afghanistan, but also to India, to Pakistan, and other countries. We also pay a lot of attention uh, to the educational programs in Afghanistan. We built a special education center in Termes. It's a border town of, with Afghanistan. Right now, more than 100 Afghan students are studying there, uh, including women. And uh, we have plans right now to increase the enrollment from 100 students to 200 students. Um, so after graduation, uh, the students will uh, got uh, a bachelor's degree. And also we are providing specialized training, very important because, for example, our A national company provides training for civil pilots in Afghanistan. Uh, our national public administration uh, provides training for uh, state servants in Afghanistan, etc. So you know, we have plans to, to expand this activity. Actually, if uh, I would summarize everything, I just uh, would like to say that we really achieved very substantial good re results in order to promote regional cooperation, in order to involve Afghanistan into regional economic ties. But at the same time, we really understand that uh, you know, we, we have a lot of things to do. Uh, we do not have any unrealistic expectations. And for example, if you look at the trade, the um, level of intra-regional trade in Central Asia is less than 10% of the total um, trade to NOVA of these countries with outside world. In, in Europe, it is uh, 60%. In APEC countries, it's about 70%. So we have still um, huge unrealized potential, and we have to work hard in, in order to, to improve this. Um, the same, uh, you know, we have to sign still uh, water agreements on water use in Central Asia. We have to find balance between openness of our borders and security issues, et cetera. Another uh, question which we have uh, to answer is, of course, what to do next? You know, how far this uh, regional integration should go? In what speed? Uh, what kind of models of regional integration we should adopt? What is the best option for us? And actually, to answer all these questions, we are planning to organize in February of this year, uh, next year, a uh, big conference and invite scholars and uh, to hear uh, their visions from different regions, uh, to hear their stories, to hear their experience in the promotion of regional cooperation. And uh, I think this will be helpful for us to make, to, to make some conclusions for ourselves, es especially if you, will, if you will take into consideration that the next meeting of the leaders of Central Asian countries will take place in Tashkent in March. The first meeting was in Astana in uh, March of this year. For the first time, leaders of Central Asian countries were able uh, to sit down. They, they gathered not on the sidelines of the CIS or SCO forum. It was purely a regional forum. It was very important. Uh, and you know, this forum really showed that Central Asian countries have the ability to solve their problems by themselves without, without external help. It was very important. Um, so, and the, the next meeting is going to, to take place in uh, Tashkent in March of this year. In conclusion, I just would like to say that, um, you know, we, we really are facing a very unique historic moment in Central Asia, and it is important for us, you know, not to miss the chance and to support this revival of regionalism in Central Asia, to help to make Central Asia more united more stable, and more prosperous. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eldor. Now, before uh, opening the floor, um, I would like to ask a few people to make a brief comments. The first, of course, are the two, two contributors to the book who are here in the room, um, Mamuka Tsereteli and Anthony Boyer. If you have any points you would like to add, something, an update perhaps to what you wrote in the book or a general comment that you think should be to the use of our audience. Um, maybe somebody could bring them a microphone. Anthony is right there at the back. Oh, thank you, Swante, and thank you everybody on the panel, Dr. Starr and our guest from Uzbekistan. 
uh, it was indeed a, a privilege and a pleasure to be part of this project, which I think is very important uh, for readers both here in the U.S. and internationally uh, to understand what's going on uh, in Uzbekistan and the many changes, some uh, long time in coming, others more recent. Um, two quick points or questions perhaps to make. Uh, the first, I'm heartened by uh, the minister's comment on the need for public education. In particular, uh, we haven't spoken a lot in this forum, uh, although in the book it is covered to a degree, about uh, democracy, in particular democracy education. So I would suggest and uh, hope to hear more about the plans for instilling civic education as a mandatory course of study in public schools. Second point uh, I would like to make, with regards to the internal situation in Uzbekistan, we've heard about foreign policy, uh, we've heard about economic relations. What about internal political dynamics in Uzbekistan? We have an election coming up in one year. What can we expect in terms of <laughs> diversification of political parties, new parties being registered, perhaps old parties being re-registered? Uh, these are things I've touched upon my chapter. would love to hear from the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll let our panelists speak about that a little bit later. Mamuka. A few words. Thank you, Swante. Uh, I think uh, uh, it's clear that Uzbekistan is undergoing uh, transformational uh, reforms and economic reforms will probably resonate in developments that the latest, but they will have the most profound impact on, on country's development. Key right now is, I think, to make sure that uh, message that uh, undervalued assets that country has, whether it's uh, uh, in, in state-owned enterprises or land or other assets that country has, uh, the assets are undervalued and foreign direct investors need to be looking at Uzbekistan, Uzbekistan as a destination. I think most important thing for country itself is to attract those uh, investors and make sure that in competition, with other potential destinations of, of foreign direct investments, they, their voice is heard, their message is heard, and uh, the, the opportunities are presented uh, exactly the way they, they are. Uh, again, uh, huge potential for foreign direct investments, and this needs to be uh, materialized. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we also have in, in the room Ambassador Vahabov, the Ambassador of Uzbekistan in Washington. Perhaps you have some additions to the panel? <coughs> Professor Starr, Svante, thank you so much for inviting me to the launching of this very remarkable book titled Uzbekistan's New Face. And here I would like <coughs> to underscore that, that, that these two gentlemen literally representing new face of Uzbekistan. Mm -hmm. And by the way, <coughs> uh, I had been studying uh, both uh, at the school and even at the university uh, with Minister Shermadov. And uh, I know well for many years, <coughs> Mr. Aripov, uh, who is actually working as a deputy, as a deputy foreign minister. Uh, Dr. Starr, uh, so um, using this opportunity, I would like to uh, ask you a question. I remember uh, when you, in May, uh, published an article uh, titled Uzbekistan, New Model for Reform in the Muslim World. And uh, you uh, rhetorically asked the audience. And so I would like to know, have you found the answer for this question? There were a few direct questions, first for, I think, the minister primarily about, <laughs> from Mr. Bauer, and then yeah. Professor Starr. Uh, Mr. Bauer, thank you very much for a very interesting question. Definitely, uh, we are now trying to uh, review all our curriculum. Actually, for the past several years, I mean, since independence, the education field was uh, very conservative. So that all the uh, reforms, even the market economy reforms, were somehow bypassed the education field. 
So uh, after the appointment by our president, the new team, we have been entrusted to make the complete, uh, uh, I mean, the complete overhaul of the education system as if uh, trying to reform from the scratch, from the uh, clear sheet of paper. Therefore, uh, now we are working with all the experts. Even during this visit, we had many meetings with our counterparts here, uh, even including the U.S. Uh, Education Department, uh, State Department, USAID, uh, Axels, and others. So that we try to now form the pool of experts, a task force, and start with the curriculum development. And definitely in those, uh, in the new curriculum, we should include all the necessary subjects, which are, uh, and they are necessary to develop the new uh, nation to be ready for the uh, market economy, as well as all the democratic reforms in the country. Okay. Just would like to add about the uh, internal political developments in Uzbekistan. Definitely parties are becoming, political parties are becoming more and more active. They present uh, different ideas, different agendas, and trying to campaign for their support through the mass media, through the public gathering. And uh, the most important thing, I believe, the parliament, parliament is becoming more and more active. The um, parliamentary control is becoming more and more um, stronger. So now parliament uh, has the right to call for the hearings any minister. Uh, they have the right uh, to initiate parliamentary investigations. And this will create some kind of checks and balances, I believe, uh, in action, which uh, really um, confirms the irreversibility of reforms. Thank you. It's obviously impossible, really, to answer your question. It's, it's very early. But it's worth noting that Uzbekistan has taken upon itself a bigger role than one country or than the region in the Muslim world. It convened a, a World Congress uh, not long ago, and at, at this event, uh, attended by Muslims, leaders of Muslim society, states, it announced that it planned to create an Imam Bukhari center in, in, in uh, the city of, of Bukhara. Why? because the second holiest book in Islam, they were not very subtly pointing out to the rest of the Muslim world, came from here. Didn't come from the Arab Middle East, came from, came from Central Asia. And this, this reassertion of their, of their central role in the history of Islam is step one. Uh, step two, uh, and by the way, they, uh, step two, they're setting up a, a, a center for enlightened Islam in Tashkent uh, for the study of these issues, Islam and reason, Islam and science, Islam and, and logic, all these fundamental questions about uh, is there only one narrow path to truth through the reading uh, the literal texts of the Quran and the Hadiths, or are there other avenues that are legitimate, and do we embrace them? Uh, Uzbekistan proposes to study this question very openly and to invite others, uh, Muslims and scholars from other uh, tradi tr uh, faith traditions, including Christianity, to participate in that. Uh, um, and, and then finally, although this is only beginning, you see evidence that Uzbekistan is, is open to embracing the idea of the secular state in a, in a society of pious believers. Uh, why have they not done so to now? Very, in very interesting, because this is a tradition that they were, uh, came from the Soviet era. But in the Soviet era, it was, it was linked with militant atheism, and now they're trying, it's not easy to say, look, we're, that's not us anymore. We're, the, the state, the laws, the courts are neutral, and they're open to every citizen. And that's, that's a, 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 an, 
not easy point to make in a formerly Soviet society, but they're definitely moving in the direction of making that point. Now, then you ask, what about, that's what's being transmitted. And I, what I'm saying is that the evidence is Uzbekistan is actively transmitting this to, to a broader world. Second, you can ask, what is being re what, what's the response? Okay, you're transmitting it. What's, what, what are, are they getting it and sending anything back? The answer is yes. Uh, it, but it's not highly visible. Uh, I, I remember as a kid watching a coal mine fire in eastern Kentucky. And when a coal mine gets on fire, you don't see a lot of smoke. You don't see flames or anything. You see little wisps of smoke popping up here and there in the land as the fire makes its way to the surface. And that's what's happening in the Muslim world. I think there are all sorts of puffs of smoke. Uh, 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 and and th I could go into this in detail. Uh, evidence that I have is the translation of my book, Lost Enlightenment, into both Farsi and now, just last uh, week, in a decision to translate it into Arabic. Very interesting. It's highly critical of various various aspects of, of, uh, of, of, of Muslim practice, especially uh, uh, Ghazali, who, who attacked reason so successfully and logic and, and, uh, uh, so su and science so successfully in, in the 12th century. I, I, I really go after him. And strange to say, he is, it's a book's being translated in, 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 in Iran and issued by a very, very authoritative religious body. What does that indicate? There are different views there. Obviously, some of these guys are delighted to publish my book because I'm saying what they want to say, but can't. And in the Arab world, this is being published in Kuwait. And again, I've already received communications from people there and who, who are saying, boy, this is, this, is, this is interesting stuff. Well, this, what I'm saying, pretty much uh, meshes with, with the position of the Uzbek government nowadays. So uh, this is a really a, a, an embrace of a moder moderate and, and uh, a brand of the faith that is open to reason and science. And, so forth, and, and civil society, and, and a secular state even. Um, now, how far will this go? Will these wisps turn into real smoke and smoke into real fire? I don't know. But there are things happening, I believe, throughout that world that are very, very interesting today. And you, you've got to look under the surface, but they're there. And I believe that the example of Uzbekistan inevitably will inspire various people in various countries to say this is a model worth emulating. The floor is now open. Uh, we have already a number of fingers up in the air. Yes, sir, in the back. My colleague will bring you a microphone. And please identify yourself and keep it brief. Uh, hi, Peter Selmore with Capital Intelligence Greater Central Asia. My question is to the minister. Um, your president had made a great meeting with Trump in May, $6.5 billion of private sector deals, John Deere, Caterpillar, Boeing. It's my understanding that uh, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross will be traveling at the end of the month at a trade mission to Uzbekistan and also Kazakhstan. Also, yesterday we had the good news, $60 billion in OPEC investment for markets like yours. What do you hope to get from this trip? Um, how positive are you, and what concrete results would you like to see from U.S. investment, and especially on this important trade mission by the Secretary of Commerce, Wilbur Ross? Thank you for the question. Uh, <clears throat> actually, uh, if you look into the history of Uzbekistan, so far uh, there wasn't uh, such a, any big development in the foreign direct investment from the U.S. side to Uzbekistan. And, it's good to see that after the visit of uh, Uzbek president here, we see so much development and uh, real projects being implemented and real foreign direct investment projects being implemented. And as you have already uh, mentioned, uh, the uh, expected visit uh, would, I hope, that add to this optimism and move forward with uh, even more concrete results. And I'm really interested uh, 
in the success of those projects because the more foreign direct investment we have from the United States and other developed countries, uh, the better becomes our economy and this should help our education sector as well because for education, as I said, we really need the investments and uh, investments comes only when we have a good economy. But uh, about the details of that visit, I think I might not be very well aware, so maybe our ambassador might add something about the uh, forthcoming visit. In a moment, we'll get to the ambassador in a moment, but sir, in the third row, yes. Uh, th thank you, uh, Samia Mitra, World Bank. I'd like to thank all our speakers for their compelling presentations of remarkable progress that has been made in a very short period of time. Uh, my first question is to, uh, and I have only two, uh, my first question is to Mr. Aripov. Uh, you've talked a lot about uh, regional uh, progress, uh, but a lot of this has consisted of bilateral, improvements in bilateral relations between Uzbekistan and a number of its neighbors, which of course has been hugely beneficial and important. I, uh, I wonder what thinking is taking place within the Uzbek government and in think tanks in Tashkent and elsewhere about looking at the region truly as a region, thinking of regional trade liberalization, thinking of investment rules that look at Central Asia, including Afghanistan, as one common region, common policies on competition, on standards for exports, of goods and services and so on, so that the region can be truly integrated and you can realize the enormous potential that you've only just begun to realize as a benefit of this regional approach. And my second question to Professor Starr is this. You, I think you gave us a very good progress report on, on judicial reforms, economic liberalization, religion, uh, the region, Afghanistan, and so on. Could you give us a similar progress report? And here I must say, time, of course, has been very short, and, and progress has been fast, so one mustn't be unreasonable. But it would be very good to have a similar progress report from you on political liberalization, democratization, the situation of human rights, and what is happening to everyday life for Uzbek citizens. How has it changed for them, if it is possible to encapsulate that? Thank you. Eldor? Yes, thank you. Uh, yes, it's a very important question. Actually, as I mentioned, in November of this year, we're going to organize for the first time Regional Economic Forum. And we will invite not only people from Central Asia, but also business people from Afghanistan. And by the way, I just recently returned from the Brussels, where we discussed with the uh, European Union what kind of projects European Union could implement in Central Asia in order to help to stimulate regional economic cooperation because the European Union recently implemented very interesting approaching, uh, projects in Latin America, in uh, Southeast Asia, and these projects were aimed especially, at, for example, to reduce trade barriers, to expand access to each other's um, markets, uh, to uh, expand the information exchange, etc. And we, uh, we talked to our European partners that these programs could be very useful for us, would be very interesting for us, and we hope that uh, actually a new EU strategy, which is going to be, um, uh, will start in 2019, will include these programs. And we will be able to, to move forward on this direction. Thank you. Well, first, I recommend strongly that you read Anthony Boyer's fine essay in the book, which does address issues of parties, parliament, and, and basically citizenship and, 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 and voluntary associations. Uh, but, but let me say, first of all, that parliament has been handed a very, very big assignment in this. And that, and that it is being asked to legislate right, left, and center in ways that it hasn't, and to initiate legislation, not just to approve stuff handed by the president's office, but it's been encouraged to initiate legislation. Now, that, that's a pretty interesting move, and we'll see how it works out in practice. What happens when the when in some 10 years from now, a different president, different parliament, parliament pr proposes something that the president flatly disagrees with. Well, there you have politics. Uh, but the door is open to very serious new relationship of parliament to, 
to, to decision making. Second, with regard to political parties, the, the, the new legislation opens the possibility of, of, of how many parties do you want, but organizing them, and if you want to be connected with some political party abroad, whoever it might be, the Social Democrats, the Conservatives, whoever, you can do it. Uh, and it actually uh, encourages this kind of contact, and uh, which means interparliamentary contacts and people who are practically involved in politics among the democratic countries, uh, there will be much more interaction with them inevitably in the future. And the third point, though, has to do with citizenship. And as Anthony mentioned, and, and as, as the minister mentioned, the idea that anyone can address power at any level is, is absolutely new. And, and, uh, and this re really works. It's, uh, why? Because I, I would say the president, uh, Mr. Yayev, spent 13 years as, 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 as prime minister. In that capacity, because he served under a very strong president, he was the guy that traveled around the country and, as we say in, in English, kicks, kicks the tires. He knows everybody who is doing this, who is not doing that, who is, who is coasting, who is not doing it, who is corrupt, and so on. He, he probably, no one had a better opportunity to learn all that than he did. His decision, his conclusion, was the only way you're going to control bureaucrats. And this is, by the way, not relevant just to Uzbekistan, hello, uh, is, to, is to empower citizens. And he's really done that. And, and leave aside even the parliamentary and party measures, the fact that individual citizens can form groups, can lobby, uh, the role of vol voluntary associations has vastly increased. This is all real. Now, how it works out in practice, we, we have yet to see. But, but show me another country that has taken this, le this bold and this distant a leap uh, uh, and, and, and so suddenly as Uzbekistan. So that's why I think we should all wish them well. Thank you. We have time for a few more. We have Mr. Yakubashvili there on the fourth row. Yes, right there. Ambassador. Former minister. Former minister. Thank you. Uh, first of all, congratulations with the book. Uh, congratulations to the Institute, to Central Asia Watchers, and definitely to Uzbekistan. It's a very timely and important book. Um, my question is for both panelists, uh, for Minister. Uh, you mentioned a very important document that the President just decreed about um, innovative development, and uh, as I understand in that document, every single governmental agency is tasked to come up with a plan, action plan. Um, it's not a secret that America is in uh, spearheading the innovations in the world, and you are in America, so uh, what are you trying to achieve in America in that regard? What you can take from America in Uzbekistan in innovation, especially in your specific area? And um, uh, for Dr. Aripov, uh, your president was recently, probably he's still there, uh, in India. So we've heard that the regional cooperation, and it seems to me that India is becoming very interesting part uh, to play in Central Asia. You can, if you can please elaborate on that visit and that prospect. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, definitely, uh, this innovative development strategy approved by president is a very important document. Uh, as you know, there is a global innovation index. Uh, which uh, has a set of indicators uh, starting from political uh, freedoms, uh, rule of law, etc., and all other uh, areas. And definitely education is also a uh, very important part of this innovative development strategy. Uh, from this visit, we would like to take to Uzbekistan the, uh, first of all, uh, we were learning uh, experience of U.S. government on managing schools as well as uh, trying to get some possible uh, positive things from this uh, overall management since we are in the process of 
reforming the public education reform. It's not that easy. It's not that easy. And there are many criticisms, and definitely, but still, this helps. And actually, what we really discussed with the meeting, uh, during the meetings with top officials here, is that uh, first thing, we would like to uh, improve uh, the teaching of English in Uzbekistan so that any school graduate, after the graduation, they should have some knowledge of English, which should definitely help them to be successful in the modern world. And another important thing which we would like to uh, take from this visit is to uh, improve uh, STEM education in our schools. So that uh, every graduate of our schools uh, should have some ability uh, to be able to earn for the living using the internet. I mean, it might be uh, some sophisticated areas like software development, uh, et cetera, where people living in Uzbekistan can outsource IT services, but it can be also some easy areas like uh, social media marketing or some uh, designs which can, they can upload in a websites like Upwork and earn for their living so that the idea is to uh, make our graduates ready for the job market. And from this perspective, US, as you said, is a, a center of innovation. And last year we have been in Silicon Valley, met with uh, many companies and tried to uh, also develop the IT uh, sector in Uzbekistan. Last year when we visited here, I was uh, acting minister of ICT, so therefore this area was more interesting for us. But hopefully, uh, uh, since education is becoming the key for the development of our country, if we are able to have, uh, uh, in, to ensure that our graduates know English, as well as have good IT skills and they can earn for their living, uh, using internet, then this should help us uh, uh, to overall government to decrease this uh, pressure in the job market and uh, to improve overall uh, well-being of our citizens. Thank you. Andrew, would you like to add something? Thank you. Um, uh, President of Uzbekistan just recently uh, finished his visit uh, to India. Had uh, high-level meetings with the Prime Minister, with the President of India, with uh, business circle. There was a big uh, business forum with Indian uh, business people. India really want uh, to strengthen its presence in Central Asia. You know that India recently uh, became, together with Pakistan, uh, members of SCO. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you look at just statistics, the share of uh, Central Asia and India is straight to know with outside world is less than zero. 0.8 percent. Uh, India does not have uh, direct access to Central Asia, but there is strong political will, and uh, there is strong political will from Uzbekistan to deepen, uh, uh, first of all, economic ties with India. We are very welcome Indian investment. We would like to deepen our relations with India in the sphere of healthcare, information technology, uh, pharma. Uh, pharma sphere, etc., and I hope that this visit will really will really make big impulse for these developments. Thank you. Thank you. Well, we are almost out of time. Uh, the gentleman in the first row, I'll give him the last question. Unfortunately, we have to be out of here. I think Mamuka in about 15 minutes or so. So uh, we'll leave it at that. Hi, my name is John Papathiofanis. I'm a graduate student at Johns Hopkins. My question is for Mr. Arapov. You touched on this a little bit in your presentation, but what are the security concerns and security measures being taken, if any, with the liberalization and opening of the border? Uh, you mentioned that multiple checkpoints are now accessible that haven't been. Uh, what are the concerns of the Uzbek government with extremis with extremists returning from the Middle East and maybe coming up through Afghanistan? Definitely, we, we understand these challenges and, and as I told you before, there is, we have to balance this openness of the border and security concerns. Um, uh, and the, the, main, the main challenge, of course, uh, the ideological threat. 
uh, you know, a lot of uh, young population being indoctrinated <coughs> um, by radical ideology. And that is why we pay so much attention uh, to the task to educate people, to task uh, to uh, in, um, give uh, especially young population more knowledge about enlightenment in uh, Islam. Professor Saul already mentioned that according to initiative of our president, we established special research center uh, of the Imam Bukhari in uh, Samarkand. We established Center of Islamic Civilization in uh, Tashkent. And the main uh, goal of these centers actually to popularize uh, the knowledge about enlightened Islam. And um, uh, you know, um, for example, in, in Central Asia, in Central Asia, in Uzbekistan, uh, Imam will not be able to preach in mosque if he does not have a special education. In, in, uh, in Uzbekistan, we have more than 10 madrasas. Two of them actually functioning since 16th century. So it's the oldest uh, religious education uh, institutions in the world. And we would like to pay to this a lot of attention in order to, uh, to help uh, these young people uh, to uh, increase them immunity against these radical ideas. Thank you, Elder. Well, to close, I think uh, about a year ago or more, we had a forum um, at which we asked the question whether something was stirring in Central Asia. Some of you may have been at that forum. I think clearly the answer is that a lot is stirring in Central Asia, uh, specifically in Uzbekistan, but as we have heard in the new connections across Central Asia with Afghanistan and between the Central Asian countries. I think during this fall, uh, this regionalism is certainly something we will come back to at this uh, CACI forum. We invite you all to be back. We thank you for coming and we thank especially our, uh, our panelists and speakers for having taken part in this. There is a forum <laughs> later this month. Yes. And there, will, and there will be a forum later this month on that issue of regionalism. You will receive it in your email. Thank you. <laughs>